Hello, and welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I'm your host, Brian Broom, and today I'm joined by Greg Uttinger and Emily Maxson. Mm. Welcome back. Hi. Uh, today Thanks. we'll be, be talking about... <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Today, we will be talking about the concept, and as we will probably find out, not necessarily just a concept, of wisdom and uh, what the scripture says about that. So, Greg, why don't you start us off? Uh, we all know Solomon, and if you ask any Sunday school child what he or she knows about Solomon, you'll probably get lots of wives, lots of gold. You might get the temple. But probably someplace along the line, you'll get, oh, and he almost cut a baby in half. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's interesting what children remember, which is one reason God puts such things in the scripture, having many reasons for most, well, for everything he does. <laughs> Solomon had become king. He, uh, God had asked him, what can I do for you? And Solomon, not asking for riches or the life of his enemies or long life for himself, asked for wisdom to judge God's people. And the first trial of this comes almost immediately in the text after the prayer is that two prostitutes come before him now they had full access to the courts it was prostitution was not an automatic death sentence in israel even if you were caught depending on who you were what was it was more complicated than that but they received equal justice under the law and normally this would be solved at the local level moses had instituted courts for 10 families 150 families 100 families thousand families uh, graduated court system. Uh, our own is modeled after it through uh, Presbyterian intervention or mediation. And so it should have been solved at the neighborhood level. Failing that, the, the larger quadrant of the city and then the city judges. Somehow it had moved very quickly up the, the court system as each judge apparently said, I don't know what to do with this. And it came before Solomon as high court judge. The, the reason was there was no evidence, there were no witnesses. Both women had given birth to children, and sometime during the night when the children were still very tiny, one woman apparently had overlaid hers and smothered it, and rather than face the loss, had switched babies. And so in the morning, the other woman woke up, and it looked like her baby was dead, and after thinking for a while, she says, no, no, wait, this isn't mine, you have mine. No, you have yours, I'm sorry, you can't handle the realities, but it's yours and this is mine. No, it's not. And so... It had come before the courts, and no one knew what to do with that. And it comes before Solomon, and he made that most famous of all judgments, which should be greater than the judgment of Paris, because Paris screwed everything up, but Solomon gets it right. <laughs> he says, all right, fine, whatever. Give me a, here, bring me a sword. What, what, what do you do, sir? I cut the baby in half, give her half, her half. That would not have worked at all times in all places, nor should you try this at home, children. But... Um, <laughs> We shall take the stuffed animal, <laughs> which you are fighting over, and cut it in half. And <laughs> There you go. Well, maybe, maybe not. But kings were strange things, and um, Saul had not been the greatest of kings. I mean, he did kill an entire priestly family and chased uh, David all over the place. So, uh, and, and David had been a rather bloody man. And there was that whole thing about Uriah, which was not exactly a secret. So here's this new king. He's an unknown quantity, and he calls for a sword to cut the baby in the half. No one says, oh, you're just joshing. That's a put on. You're trying to make a pointer. They, everybody there takes a deep breath and, and realizes he uh, he's going to cut the baby in half. At which point, the real mom says, I, I, no, give, give it to her. Uh, she can have it. Don't, don't kill the baby. The other one says, eh, cut, cut it in half. It can shouldn't be anybody's. And Solomon looks to the real mom and says, it's hers, give it to her. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not told what happened to the other woman or if Solomon inflicted any penalties, nor does it terribly matter for our purposes. The point was that Solomon's ability here came from an understanding of human nature, not because he had taken laws in uh, forensic, or classes in forensic or criminal law or in uh, criminology, chem, uh, forensic chemistry or some such thing. He didn't know about DNA. He knew what God said about sin and about grace. And he moved in terms of those. And all Israel feared his judgment from there on out. So we, when we think of Solomon, we often think of him as the wisest man ever. That's kind of what God said he would do for him. You'll have great wisdom like them before you. 
Later on, he manages to screw that up real well. But for now, while he's young, he writes a book. We call it Proverbs, which probably is not the greatest name in the world for it. And he writes to his son and instructs him in wisdom. Now, the reason I say Proverbs is probably not the greatest name for it is because we think of Proverbs, we think of aphorisms all of Ben Franklin <laughs> or morals yeah. of the story a la Aesop. And we it, it becomes a sort of, you know, early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. And that's about as far as we see into it. And, mm-hmm. and people who are teaching Sunday school and want children to have nice little moral epigrams that they can recite at will or they can remind them of to tell them to do right from wrong tend to latch on to Proverbs. But unfortunately, I think often for the wrong reason, they become, in effect, a new program of works righteousness. Yep. And if you do this and live, you want to be wise, you want to be healthy, you want God's blessing, well, follow these, memorize these, and keep them, keep them near your heart and do them. And I think if you ask the average Christian, and unfortunately, even the average pastor, and sometimes the average commentator, where's Jesus in all this? I think you're going to get kind of a blank stare. There are some exceptions. In the Old Testament? <laughs> yeah, in the Old Testament. We're already in the Old Testament. We're in Proverbs now, and you expect to find Jesus there? Well, maybe there's a couple of verses here or there. I don't know. But, now, but Solomon wrote it, and he like wasn't even a Christian. Yeah. <laughs> he had 700 wives. Plus 300 concubines, which technically were wives. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, what's with this? Um, but as we come to the book, we're told, he actually tells us what it's about. It's to know wisdom. And instruction to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. Now, notice the things he wraps up there. Wisdom, instruction, understanding, justice, judgment, equity, maintaining the proper balance between the different directions commandments may seem to be pulling, subtlety to the simple, and knowledge and discretion. And yes, to understand Proverbs and the words of the wise and their dark sayings. So we come to this, and Solomon has said to his son, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write all this down so that you will learn how morality, ethics, wisdom, discretion, knowledge, how all of these are intricately intertwined. And anybody who studied philosophy, particularly epistemology, should have their ears broken up and say, wow, cool, we're going to get a treatise on you know, universals in particulars and epistemological self-consciousness and uh, ontological arguments and presuppositional thinking. And yet, no, we don't. The first thing he says is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So first of all, wisdom is rooted in a right relationship with God. And that that relationship is one of awe, seriousness, taking God seriously, being afraid to displease him, being afraid of his wrath if we are in the way of sin, standing in awe of his majesty and of his greatness, knowing who he is as creator and judge of the universe as well as our savior. That's where all knowledge, not only wisdom, which I'll say later, but knowledge itself starts. And so there's some good foundation for presuppositional thinking. If you do not acknowledge God in the long run, you're not going to know or understand anything as you want. Because if you don't know the creator, you can't understand creation. And, 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 and do wonderful lectures on that, and, and people have over the years. It's a favorite verse of Christian educators. But you would think, okay, so the, we're going we're gonna to go down that road, presuppositionalism. But no, the next thing he says is, my, my son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Wait, I wanted to talk philosophy. You're telling me you obey mom and dad? Yeah. <laughs> Uh-huh. Well, that's philosophy. That's philosophy. It's a different kind of philosophy, isn't it? It's not what most people would expect. And when you start reading books on epistemology, it is rarely the second thing you encounter. Um, you, you, in fact, I, I don't know of any book on epistemology, published at any rate, that has as its second chapter, honor your father and your mother. And yet that's what he's saying here. And it's not just honor your fathers in terms of ancient tradition. You could walk down um, some of the older conservative books and go back to Edmund Burke, for instance. It's, mm-hmm. it's all about tradition and uh, what we've received from those who went before us. He's not really saying that, although oh, there's some truth in it, to be sure, but he's talking about your actual mom and dad who are out there in the kitchen having coffee. Go talk to them 
and and listen to them and let them remind you of what they have told you in the past and the rules they've set down for their household, you want to be wise. Do what they say. Listen to them. Take them seriously. Uh, Is Solomon just propping up his own authority because he's the person's father? <laughs> yeah, I might think so. And um, one of the things that we're going to see, well, anybody who reads it at least will see, the first several chapters of Proverbs is he keeps coming back to, listen to me, my son, my son, listen, listen, open your ears, write my, listen, take my words seriously, write them on your heart, listen to what I'm saying, I'm your father, listen to my word. It would be easy to conclude in the abstract that, yeah, he's just making a bid for power in his son's life, but we're, we're coming to this as the inspired word of God, and we will believe up front that that's not what's going on, although people, commentators are, are about that less generous when we come to Solomon Ecclesiastes. Yeah, that's Solomon with his sour grapes and just spouting <laughs> humanism of his old age. No, this is the word of God. And uh, having just started with the fear of the Lord is the first thing, not the second thing. And honoring mom and dad is the second thing, not the first thing. I think we should assume that he knows what he's talking about. <clears throat> and um, but, but it does bring us to the question, and it's an important one. Why doesn't he say, listen to the law of God? And, and I think there are two answers. One, he just did. Mm -hmm. To say, fear God. He'll, he'll, and he'll say this in Ecclesiastes, I think, in case anyone missed it. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, some of you complained in, the, in your reviews of my previous book, and I wasn't clear. I thought I was very clear when I said, fear God. That means keep his commandments. Thank you very much. <laughs> but um, the temptation of youth is always to jump ahead of things. Mm. Well, yes, see, but I, I I don't need to listen to mom and dad because I've read the Bible and I've studied theology. And I know all kinds of cool stuff that mom and dad, bless their hearts, haven't learned yet. So I don't really have to listen to them and their things because they're, they're not really in harmony with scripture. I'll, I'll skip ahead and stand on my own two feet and be a grown up. And Solomon's saying, um, let's not do that, huh? Isn't this... I Forgive me if I'm if I'm jumping ahead here, but this is kind of a reflection of Adam and Eve in the garden, isn't it? Where they have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm, yeah. And it's God said, no, you know, we can theorize at least for now. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to jump ahead. And so when Solomon asked the Lord for wisdom, which I believe is the same word. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I've been told that what he asked for was the same thing, the knowledge of good and evil or discernment, yeah. that he looked to the Lord for that rather than assuming he had it or could seize it for himself. Yeah, he, he presents himself humbly for God to receive this. And wisdom is the peculiar gift for kings uh, to discern between good and evil. Uh, it's a characteristic of Messiah, not judge after the sight of his eyes, nor hear after the hearing of his ears, but reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. Isaiah. Well, then also, also too, it's just a, a reiteration of obviously the fifth commandment, but in its extensions as well, like the Westminster draws out from the fifth commandment, not just mothers and fathers, but also all superiors for, right. in, in all situations. It's, you could even read it as, you know, the people who've been placed in ecclesiastical authority over you. It's like mm -hmm. don't don't go outside of them just because you think you found this new thing in scripture that everyone else has missed. Yeah. Look yeah. <laughs> at them and look at how they have stewarded the truth and look at that in comparison to scripture. Scripture's the first, but these are your sureties mm. to an extent. Your yeah, your your helpers, your boundary lines. See, if, they, if your parents have been down this road and they went, they turned left, turning right for you, maybe. Is something you should think three times about and then still maybe follow your parents. <laughs> Unless your parents said, yeah, we turned left. Don't do that. That was yeah. bad. <laughs> yeah. Never go that way. So submission to parents, yes, and in, in all of their failures, I don't remember the phrasing of the Heidelberg Catechism, but it's similar, that we bear with them in all of their frailties and weaknesses mm. yeah. and submit ourselves to their good judgment. Beginning, again, with really mom and dad, we, we, it's, it's the tendency is to skip past them to further authorities that are further off. Well, let's start real close to home. How do you treat your parents? You want to be wise? Then learn to listen to mom and dad. Well, but, you know, they're weak Christians. Listen to mom and dad. Well, dad's not even safe. Listen to mom and dad. 
Well, their rules aren't exactly God's at all points. Still, listen to them. You may find mm -hmm. grounds at some points for departing from them if what they say is leading you away from the fear of God. But don't start with, I know so much stuff and I can just skip them and not listen to them. I can find truth in philosophy books or theology books without listening to my parents. What's the line and, and from so, Deuteronomy? God is not a God far off and not close at hand. Yeah. <clears throat> God, God is exceedingly close at hand. The point that the wise man here will make over and over and over again with, listen. And I, I even turn to my kids in class and say, why do you think God says listen so much? And they, because we don't. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that just the truth? <laughs> yeah. The, the third thing in, in chapter 1, verse 10 and this used to confuse me when I was younger. It's no confusion now at all. <clears throat> My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay, for, lay, lay wait for blood, and let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave, whole as those that go down to the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our house with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. Son, walk not thou in the way of them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood, and so on. What he's talking about is gangs. Now, I'm older than you are by a lot. And when I grew up, gangs were not a thing. Gangs were the 1920s in Al Capone. <laughs> now, if you watch TV, you may have heard, you may hear about the Crips and Bloods as some kind of youth thing in the big city, New York, Los Angeles. But they didn't, you know, yeah, it didn't touch us. It, Warn kids about gangs. What's the big deal here? God often picks extremes to make his points. For instance, meat offered in sacrifice to idols. I don't think any of us very often actually encounter that as a thing. But he's picked an extreme case. If, if meat that has come before demons for their approval is something that we can talk about and it's something that has a valid use, how much more? Everything less. Mm -hmm. And if you should not kill your neighbor, then does not it follow that his he is valuable and there are other things you also should not do to your neighbor. He, <laughs> picks, he picks gangs here, not because every generation has them. Mine didn't. This one does, for sure. And it's becoming more and more of a thing. And, and they're not always full-fledged gangs like the Crips and Blood. Sometimes it's just very dangerous cliques in schools where if you don't belong, you are somebody's enemy and, and liable to physical violence for not being part of that in-group. And, and the word here is what, whatever the nature in your generation, in your time, in your culture, there are going to be groups of people who are going to invite you in. And the temptation is to want to be in the inner ring. See Lewis's <laughs> essay, The Inner yes. Ring, and his <laughs> that hideous strength. The novel, that, that Hideous Strength, if you don't know what that means. And uh, what he's saying is, that, yeah, there, there is something in the human heart that desires to be in. It, it's a corruption of our, um, our desire for fellowship with God. But rather than submit to God, we, we make other relationships our idols. And we, want to, we want to establish our identity by belonging to some group that will make us feel good, will give us, let us be on the inside, will give us power or wealth or something. Here, these people are offering money, a sense of community and unity. Uh, and a lot of fun killing people, apparently. Uh, and, and Solomon says right up front, if they come to thee and say, hey, you want to join? Say, no, and go the other direction. Now, the rest of the book is going to be a lot about that in the negative sense. Here are the people you should not hang out with. They should not be your friends. That doesn't mean you don't show them the love of God, pray for them, give them a cup of cold water in Jesus' name when they're thirsty and all that. But it does mean they shouldn't be your best buds and they shouldn't be defining your lifestyle for you. It's the question, and in many ways, this is the question of Proverbs. Who, who are your people? Who do you belong to? Some of you know the, the novel Good Omens, which I will neither recommend nor not recommend because it's not everyone's <laughs> taste. But little girl Pepper says, sooner or later, everyone has to decide which gang they belong to. And I think that's a profound statement. In many ways, coming to Christ is choosing relationship. Who, who are you going to belong to? Not just who singularly I belong to Jesus. But belonging to Jesus means you belong to his people, his crowd, his covenant and community, his church. And that's the way of wisdom. When you start hanging around, he that walk, we, we see this later in Proverbs, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise. 
a companion of fools shall be destroyed. And that's pretty much a summation of the book. Uh, you that's want to be wise? pretty much a summation of the Bible. Oh, yeah. well. <laughs> exactly. You, you, you want to be wise, then you have to hang out with wise people. You cannot hang out with, with foolish people and be wise. It just doesn't work. And wise people are godly people. Just said they're people who fear God and who respect the people he's put in authority in their lives. They're not revolutionaries. They are, they are in that sense, conservative. <laughs> uh, in that they, they look to the previous generation and see their God's hand and God's work. It doesn't mean just because someone's older, right? But we look to the past and immediately to our parents uh, and the older saints we know, our pastors and elders, to see, well, what has God said? And we start there as a teacher in a school that is interdenominational. One of the things that, that I do and that I encourage others to do and others encourage others to do is you, you run into a difficult question or something that's controversial. You can say, well, what do you all think? What do, you, what, do you, what do your churches say? And try to, but then you have to guard very carefully that people aren't attacking each other. But usually the best answer is, that's a really great question. Go home and talk to your parents about that. Go back. Have you, have you asked your pastor? Go talk to your pastor. I'm sure he'd love to have a conversation with you about that. That is a wonderful there was, <laughs> There was actually a, um, a Facebook group for a while where that was the refrain of, of the admins because it was a like marriage advice mm. group and you know single mm. singles were allowed to join, which is why I was in it at the time, uh, before it imploded violently. <laughs> and um <laughs> Was, was there a podcast associated with this? There Facebook was a group? podcast associated with The podcast with this. was great. Yes, it the was. The group, not I, so much. Uh, no. <laughs> um, but in any case, uh, that was that was the refrain because people would uh, – husbands and wives would be in the group together or maybe just uh, one of the couple would join. And then they would ask a question. It was always this very leading kind of thing like <laughs> – well, in this situation, and then it was like super favorable <laughs> to their side, you know, like, yeah. shouldn't my husband let me choose the curtain color, <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. And they were like, that's a stupid question. Go ask your pa pastor. Have you talked to your pastor? Have you done counseling with your pastor as a yeah. couple? Because that sounds like a thing you need to do. Yeah. And, <laughs> like, uh, to, issues here. <laughs> to go back just a, a second, like just talking about company again, is that like, bad company has a corrupting influence if if you are not actively involved in rebuking mm. either implicitly or explicitly uh their folly you will be corrupted you're not going to be this bit of alcohol in sullied water you're just <laughs> going to be water in sullied water and you will become sullied water as well and it reminds me of you know uh, the only word I have for it is proverbs, but like not from the book of proverbs, but cultural proverbs like uh. um, don't play chess with a pigeon because it'll just knock the pieces over and think it won. <laughs> uh, okay. If a madman steals your clothes, don't chase after him because they'll just see two naked madmen running through the street. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, there's a third one. I, something here. <laughs> the third one I can't remember, but the idea is, you know, don't don't play their game, don't mm -hmm. don't join them in the thing that makes them foolish, yeah. because it just makes you look a fool, and eventually you will be the fool because you'll be running through the streets without your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Metaphorically speaking, <laughs> I should hope. I would hope. Euripides in 430 <laughs> BC said, "Every man is like the company he is wont to keep." Except he said it in Greek. Paul said, <laughs> <laughs> evil communications corrupt good manners. Yeah. So it, 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 wisdom is a matter of community and communion. It is not a matter of being smart and reading books and knowing various schema and principles and facets and syllogisms. There may be a place for all of that. But... Fundam the fundamental wisdom that God is after is not that. It has to do with walking with God and keeping his commandments. That implies justifying faith granted by the Holy Spirit, the ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit to produce the fruits of obedience, and ongoing submission to the word of God, which means ongoing fellowship with God through that word. But 
the whole thing and, and the danger is always to reduce it gnostically to just me and God, <laughs> my soul and God. That's all I really, maybe the Bible, maybe. That's, that's all, that's all we need. And Solomon's saying, you know, there are people mm -hmm. and, and, and who you keep your company with is, as you say, it's going to affect you. There's no neutral position you can take where you'll go and be the Christian witness among all these people. How, however, never witnessing to anything except by your, by your lifestyle, by the fact that you don't, uh, you don't join them with everything they do. That's not a witness. That, that's called, uh, I think it's called treachery, actually. You're betraying <laughs> God and you're betraying your, yeah. your evil companions. Doesn't this indicate wisdom is personal by nature, well, which yeah. leads us to ask who is wisdom? But and we will ask that question maybe, just a second. Yeah, let me, let me throw this out while I'm thinking about it. Not, <laughs> not very later, because that's the next verse. But let me throw this out um, in terms of uh, who you keep company with. One of the more common questions I get from my students over the years is, is it all right for me to have non-Christian friends? Because I was talking to my mom, dot, dot, dot. Okay, the real problem here <laughs> has to do with not listening to your mom and not and trying to understand what she's actually saying to you. Mm. But the uh, what I what I answer is look, and they'll they'll usually provide this because if I don't have non Christian friends, how can I ever witness to anybody? Okay, that's great. Yeah, is that actually what you're doing? When you have a non Christian friend, are you becoming the leader in the relationship? Are you at every point? imposing the word of God. No, we can't do that because God says not. Let's go do this. No, you know what God says about that? No, we, we come. there are Christians who befriend non-Christians, and the non-Christians follow the Christians because the Christians are strong, charismatic, kind, winsome, and worthy of being followed. And then there are other Christians who try to latch on to non-Christians, and they end up being the tail. The Christian follows the non-Christian wherever they go, maybe stopping just short of blatant sin, but they're never rebuking them. Well, if I rebuke them, and then it's going to cause tension, and I, well, he won't want to hang out with me if I'm not if he's not hanging out. If I'm not hanging out with him, how can I be a witness? <laughs> yeah, about that. <laughs> There's some, some political implications. If I actually press for a godly program in government, I won't get reelected. Then how can I press for a godly program in government? Yeah, we can look at Abraham and Lot. Abraham befriended non Christians and won him won them to faith in the God of Israel, so that when he needed a strike force, they were there with him, ready to risk their lives. Lot went into Sodom and hung out with non-Christians, and it destroyed everything. So when we're saying this, when you're not saying you cannot befriend a non-Christian, the question is, how are you going to do it? Are you going to do it in wisdom? Are you going to sell out Jesus? Now, Emily has brought, brought us to the next step. So what is this wisdom thing? Well, this wisdom thing is not a thing, and that's the point. That's where we were, we've been going. And Solomon immediately <clears throat> shows us wisdom. In verse 20, wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the street. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city. She uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and you refused, because I stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but you said it not all my counsel, you would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own ways and be filled with their own devices, for the turning of the way of the simple shall slay them, the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. So there's wisdom, and we're still left with the, okay, that's nice. What, who? What are we talking? Is this an abstraction? Is this a divine attribute? Is this, She's female. That can't have anything to God to do with God. God's masculine, right? So what's going on here? Uh, and, and generally, I think the solution has been to say this is some divine attribute being personified. And she, and there's, I, I've never seen many explanations of why it would be labeled she. But we, we then leave wisdom and we spend the next several chapters with the father saying, pay attention. 
listen. My son, if thou wilt receive my words, incline thy ear, cry after knowledge, seek her as silver. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Uh, happy is the man that findeth wisdom and getteth understanding. Hear ye children, the instruction of a father, attend to no understanding. Uh, my, my father taught me, he said, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, get wisdom, get understanding. Uh, my son, attend to my wisdom and bow down thy ear to understanding. Yeah, you get the idea? That That's chapter five. We're still, or chapter four, we're still, listen, 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 listen. And and some 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 encourages as to why long life, riches, peace, the blessings of God. But what keep thy heart with all diligence. We're not talking about the superficial, external kind of law keeping. We're talking about something that gets into your heart and changes you. But you have to listen for it to happen. You have to pay attention, and you have to pay attention to the very people that maybe you by nature will cite, like your parents say, or your elders. And then, finally, he turns to something else. He begins to warn of, of, the, kind of, of the kind of people that obedience, that wisdom will keep you from. It'll keep you from the evil man and the strange woman. Strange woman, strange means foreign. That is someone outside the covenant. And there'll be a lot about her. For instance, uh, where does it start? For the lips of a strange woman, this is chapter five, drop as a honeycomb and her mouth is as smooth as oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold of hell. But over against that, drink waters out of thine own cistern, running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed to broad rivers of water in the streets. Let them be only thy own, not strangers with thee. Let thy fountains be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. And he gets very explicit in his language. So <clears throat> we're still at choosing relationships. So we're moving past father and mother or through father and mother to the next step. Son, you got to get married. You're a prince. You need a princess. And as you look, let me show you Lady Wisdom. Now, compare wisdom with these two women. There's the strange woman who is all superficial, all seduction, all appealing to the lust of the flesh, the uh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And there is the woman you ought to be looking for, whom you could be faithful with and have kids with. And um, you, you're going to have to be making a choice here. And it comes back to this in chapter 6, talking again about the commandments. Verse 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light and the reproofs of instruction are the way of life to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of the strange woman, lust not after her beauty, and so on. Again, the, the constant warning. There, there is a, there's a seduction here. And when we get to chapter 7, we have a, we have a long description of it. I, Propose we just kind of say, you read it, everyone, you probably already know about it. But as we look at this, first, just a couple obvious things. She she lives in the midst of the covenant people. She claims to be a convert. She's just come back from the temple with peace offerings. Yeah, I just came back from youth group. I just came back from the Lord's Supper. Hey, I, 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 I they had some extra wine. I brought it with me. Come on over and celebrate. She claims to be religious. She puts on a good front. She dresses immodestly. She's never called a prostitute. She's not. She doesn't charge. She's, uh, but she dresses like one, so outward modesty is actually a thing. But she is very impudent up front, uh, very actively tries to seduce, seduce this young man. The young man, on the other hand, goes where he can find her. He knows where she lives, her corner. And he goes in, in the dark and black night. It's a new moon where there's no there's a time before streetlights. There's no moon. There's, there's just the stars. So he's moving in real darkness here to get to this woman and accidentally finds her. What are the odds? <laughs> At which point she says, Wow, what a coincidence. Yeah, I, I just happened to be wandering out here in the red light district, uh, just taking some exercise, and there you are. So first of all, most obviously, she is there. there is the real danger from flesh and blood women who are like this. But far, in a far bigger picture, folly itself is like this. Folly 
uh, thinking you can get through life apart from fearing God, apart from submission to the authorities God has placed in your life, apart from God's law, that's a, that's a, a harlot and a seductress in herself. And here we can flash forward to the book of Revelation where we see Babylon the Great as the great whore. And the implication of the text, which I won't argue here, I'll just say what I think, is that she represents a religious system, particularly works righteousness, particularly apostate Judaism. Here, come have all of God's blessings without having to ever have learned in your heart the fear of God. Mm -hmm. And it is deadly. But just as Revelation has two women, the, the whore and the faithful bride, so Proverbs has two women. It's, it's, just, it's a deliberate connection. Uh, we, the, the, the prince here is, should be looking for a woman who looks like wisdom. When we come to chapter 8, we're back to wisdom again. And it starts much as it did before. Does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of the high places. By the way, the places of the past, she cries in the gates at the entry of the city, at the coming in of the doors. Unto you, O men, I call. My voice is to the sons of man. O you simple, understand wisdom. And you fools, be of an understanding heart. And it goes on. And again, she, she shows how valuable her wares are. Are the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, the evil way, the forward mouth, do I hate. But she offers counsel and understanding, the ability to judge rightly, even in political office. Riches and honor she offers. Her fruit is better, but her fruit is better than gold and, and fine gold and than silver. Uh, righteousness, judgment. And yes, back to, and, and there are material side benefits of being a wise person. <clears throat> and then Wisdom says this in verse 22. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the field, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the earth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountain of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable parts of the earth. Now, at this point, <clears throat> we are forced to look again at who this wisdom is. Possessed from eternity, brought forth from eternity, there at creation, with God and yet distinct from God. This sounds like John 1. Mm -hmm. The uh, the word for uh, possessed in verse 22, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways, is the word that Eve used when she brought forth Cain. I've gotten a man. I've possessed him. How? By giving birth to him. She didn't buy him. She brought him forth. Uh, this I take to be Jesus, to be the eternal Lagos, the divine word. I would well, you're in good company. <laughs> <laughs> I would recommend Charles Bridges' commentary on Proverbs. He has a fantastic section on this. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of people still are, well, no, because it couldn't be. I think a lot of it is still what you said. But it's the Old Testament. Yes, and right in the heart of this book, we find Jesus, which was what we ought to expect. Um, I, th I, think I think there's the, also a, a desire to make it a one for one, where the hills were brought forth, so this wisdom was brought forth, mm. but that indicates that Christ wouldn't be co-eternal with the Father, mm. this would be Arianism, Patrick. Where I, I think that argument does actually miss the forest for the trees. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also <laughs> think that there, would be one argument against it. I also think there is probably reasoning behind the fact that, but wisdom is feminine here and yes. God is, <laughs> Jesus is the sun. So right. it can't be that because right. poetry doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, which is why everybody who studies systematic theology should take at least a year of studying <laughs> biblical theology and a year of studying poetry, <laughs> yes. preferably from, uh, uh, what's his name, um, Sound and Sense by Lawrence Perrine would be a good place to start. Mm. Uh, she, what? let's step back. What, what She, 
He's looking for a bride. And in the he's, last chapter, he finds her. But let's just turn the question a little bit differently. Where in this world, in, with flesh and blood on, do you expect to find Jesus most clearly outside the word and sacraments themselves? And I would hope every godly man and godly woman would answer, well, in my spouse. With all of his failings and sins, he is the best representation of Christ I've ever seen, ever lived, ever known. That's why I married him. That's why I married her, because she was, she, he was so godly. I found Jesus there, and he, he, she continues to show me Jesus day by day. And when we get to the end of the book, yes, he marries a godly lady, at least in Solomon's projection of how things are going to work. Uh, why she? Because she over against folly. Folly is personified in this foolish woman, and so Christ puts himself forward in that feminine dimension because we're looking here at human relationships. We started with fear God, but how does that play itself out in human relationships? Well, one, make good godly friends, but two, even more than that, marry a godly man or woman. Um, if you want to be wise, marry a godly spouse. That's, that's where this is going. And having been a teacher now for an awful long time and seen a lot of my students not marry godly spouses, I am keenly aware, painfully aware, uh, volatilely aware of, I should say, aware, not unaware, of um, how this gets ignored. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it's because the other person puts on a really good act for a while. But often not. Uh, you're serious about this Christianity business. You're serious about walking with God. You're serious about knowing Jesus. You're serious about being wise. Then pursue someone along those lines and forget a lot of the, the standards of the world, including of all the Disney films, as to how you might find such a person. Get, out, get rid of your ideas of what romance looks like. And someday my prince will come and start pursuing godly people. And godly people not, are not necessarily se seminary graduates. <laughs> but, they, but they might be. Um, and if somebody is taking seminary classes, not to be full of himself because he's a theologian and he knows cool stuff, but because he just really wants to know more about the Lord. Well, that might be a person to pursue. Yeah. Pursue Christ in your future spouse. And when we get to the end of the book, that's, of course, what we find. Everyone knows the excellent woman at the end of the book in chapter 31 uh, a virtuous woman, her price is far above rubies, just like wisdom. And she uh, is wisdom at work. She's constantly busy, constantly taking care of people. Her In her tongue is the law of kindness. Strength and honor are, are her clothing. Mm. She stretches out her hand to the poor and the needy, and so on. She will be praised in the gates. She, the woman that feareth the Lord. She shall be praised. So we come full circle. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Here's the woman that fears the Lord. This is who you're supposed to marry. Now, if, now, as I have to do this, lest young girls be beaten over the head with the passage. This in, in earth, in this life, this is the woman you you want and pray that your wife will grow into. No woman starts out like this. This is no man starts out being Jesus. Uh, and yet, the, and the other thing, or ends up being or Jesus, ends for up that being matter. Jesus and, and by the same logic, you should not expect that your wife will ever exactly be this. But God again shows us extremes. This is the direction the Christian life should tend. Um, and and I point out to girls, you know, girls, yes, you have this one chapter that tells you what an ideal woman looks like. The the guy has thirty chapters telling him what an ideal guy looks like, so he'll be worthy of you. And, always, and a lot of it is repetition because yeah. we have <laughs> thick heads. Yeah, yeah. It's, there's a lot of repetition because we, yeah, you know, they'll think, well, God, if God says something twice, we better take it very seriously. No, He said it twice because you were stupid and stubborn and weren't listening the first time. That's but also, important. yes, you should listen to it again because He He means it. Yeah, <laughs> He wanted this really, one to get through really to you. It. Yeah, and you, you might have your mind might have been drifting the first time. So He has He has reasons for I, being Himself. I remember this is just an anecdote, slightly related. Uh, I remember now. The irony is I can't remember what the actual statement was, but I remember reading a book, and it it was some kind of theology book or devotional or something along those lines, and they said a statement, and then like they did a paragraph break, and he goes, "Now, now, reader, wait." 
go back and read that again because Satan didn't want you to hear that. <laughs> and he just distracted you from understanding it. And I went back and I was like, son of a gun. I did. <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> And that's that's kind of what God does a lot, and but especially yeah. in Proverbs, where he's like, here, here it is again, slightly differently phrased, in case you misunderstood it the first time. Yeah. And sometimes and it's, it's not even differently phrased. It's exactly the it's same exactly words. The same phrasing. <laughs> it's it's that's just how our minds work. We get easily distracted when it comes to sitting down and looking at what God has said, because we do also have not just a sin nature, but an adversary who wants to keep us from learning more about God and being more content in him, which is also uh, something else I wanted to bring up earlier. I couldn't find a good segue into it. But that's also why it's really sad and a little bit ironic when people look at Proverbs in this micro view, where Mm -hmm. they look at each thing as a list of things to do to accomplish, because they completely miss the fact that, you know, I, I would agree with you that folly is works righteousness. And then they take all this good advice, all, all of this stuff that points us back to Christ and basing our knowledge in him and go, that that's what we got to do. We got to yeah. fulfill all these things right. so that God blesses us with, you know, long life, prosperous finances and salvation even. Yeah. And yeah. you've just missed the, the, the entire point you missed the point and you're letting the t- the tail wag the dog instead of the dog yeah. wag the tail once we realize what the nature of proverbs and we understand that it is christ centered what we should see here just as in psalms we see christ singing about the covenant of the law that is to say his relationship with his father we should here should see christ meditating on the torah on the way of life on mm. and again not a list of rules but on the divine revelation that all of all of Scripture gives to us about who God is and what He wants for us and expects to us and promises us, and so as we read through Proverbs, we should be meditating with Christ. We should be thinking His thoughts out. Oh, this is what Jesus thinks of that. Oh, this is how Jesus is approaching this. Oh, this is what Jesus thinks about such things, and and see it not so much as an immediate do this and live, but as a oh, this is what Jesus is like. And if we've learned to love Jesus, then the following step of, oh, and then I should think this way too. I should be like this too, will be the follow-up. But first, we need to know who Jesus is and how he thinks about things. And, you know, Do- when we have a good friend or an older person we respect, or even our moms and dads, we come and say, Mom, Dad, what, what are your thoughts about this? Pastor, what are your thoughts about this? And we sit and we listen quietly, one hopes. And not so much of as a... Tell me how to think, but let me see how you think. And if we yeah. respect them and follow along, I remember one time my my first pastor, more or less first pastor, my the man who was a mentor for most of my life, Pastor Pal, was objecting to federal vision. This was when it was a new thing, and I still did not know a whole lot about it. And, it's still uh, so hard to nail down and keep in my head because it's also slippery. It is very slippery, and and we uh, David Farsham and I were there visiting him in Colorado. And we read a a text, something they had written that sounded really good. And we ask him, or I ask him, what should we be hearing here? Not tell us why this is wrong or tell us what to believe, but tell us how to read this. Tell us what's going on here. His his first statement was, well, you know what? There's nothing wrong with that except everything. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, meaning as you said it's very slippery. federal vision it, in a nutshell yeah it, it, if, if you read the words in your framework you can make it come out all right but that's not what they're really saying and it takes wisdom and experience to read between the lines as it were yeah my, my, my point there is that we did not sit, sit down and say please give us a lecture on federal vision we just ask how how do you how are you reading this what what are we not getting Go on. Just talk to us about this. Yeah. And sometimes that's a great question. I, 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 I'm struggling with this. Can you just talk to me about this for a while? And, and let it become a conversation and, and do a lot of humble listening. Mm-hmm. This is the kind of thing that's going on here. Jesus is thinking through this out loud for us. Let's drop in on his thoughts and eavesdrop and hear him process then. And as we do, and as that thinking becomes a part of us, and begins to shape us, then we can turn around and look at practical things. 
But to try yeah. to make it a one for one, do this and live, do this at worst, do this and get rich, is very destructive and leads, leads exactly where it's not supposed to. Yeah. I, I had something I was going to say. Oh, I don't know. Like, anyone can look at the world, at historical evidence, at so to speak, experiments, and figure out how to do things in a way that works. Because God's world yeah. works according to God's nature. It is consistent with itself. It mm -hmm. is orderly. Uh, generally speaking, when you do stupid things, stupid things happen. And when you do smart <laughs> things, good things result. Yeah. Anyone can do that. And, and uh, you don't need to be redeem to know that two plus two equals four or to, to at least do the math on the page right or to you know figure out oh if i focus for two hours and get my work done then i get paid that that is super basic <laughs> it's an entirely different thing to know god and to do those things out of a motivation of honoring him mm -hmm. because you can do all the right things. You can, you know, like the, the, the rich young ruler said, all these things I have kept ever since my youth no. and still and go away unsatisfied. Yeah. You can still go away unsatisfied because you don't get the whole picture. You're, you are, you are following outward forms without an inward reality. And I, somewhat shudder to use that particular phrase because it's overused in everything and it's kind of christianese but it is it is true yeah and so the, the theme here then is not to chase you away from proverbs but to invite you to read proverbs as keeping company with jesus for a while uh, yeah. and, and and therefore the suggestion yeah that it's fine to take a proverb here or there a few verses isolate them and meditate on them as it is with any other part of scripture but it's also important to read the chapters as they flow into one another there were no chapter breaks in the original just follow the thoughts of the author it's easy to say to say well these are just random verses thrown together in a random order okay we're talking about god so no the fact randomness that... is not a function of his universe <laughs> yeah um it's, it's not an attribute of god so that's not the case. Does that mean we automatically know what, how they're arranged or why they're the way they are? No, it doesn't. And as far as I can see over the centuries, not a lot of work has been done along those lines. I taught through Proverbs and Bible study years and years ago, and it, it was pretty easy to go through chapter eight um, and nine, and then you begin to hit the, the, the solid, more proverb -y part around it. I mean, in 10 and 11, it was still pretty easy to see <laughs> yeah. there is a divine order here. But someplace after that, I began to lose it. Like, I don't, because I hadn't thought enough about it. I haven't read it enough. I have not meditated enough on it. And, and, and you know, we people make um, books, and, and, and uh, I understand the usefulness, but I also perceive at least some danger where you, you, you pick a, a heading, um, marital faithfulness or drunkenness or work ethic, and you collect all the relevant Proverbs out of Proverbs and put them in these categories. <laughs> yeah. I, there, I can see that, but I also am a little wary of it because God put those in the order he did for a reason. And it's like systematics. We pull verses out of context all the time to put as footnotes in our, our, our confessional statements. But the implication there is not this one verse stands by itself, but this verse is part of an ongoing argument in its original context. And if you go and find this verse and read the argument around it, you will see it does indeed say what we're saying. And I'm not sure that with Proverbs that always comes across. Here's this book. Here's, this, here's all the verses on drunkenness. Okay, yeah, and there's a time to be have them ready at hand. Okay, that's good, but let's be a little careful here. Because we are pulling it out of, of out of the overall context of what of all of everything that led up to it and everything that follows it, and we are far less in Proverbs likely to go back and consider the context. So, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, for instance, there's that verse that says, "Don't look at the wine as it sparkles in the glass," and then Jesus later points to a glass of wine and says, "This is my blood." It's like I feel like Jesus <laughs> might want us to look at that cup of wine, you know. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Maybe. 
And of course, the two the, the, this comes to its climax in the two verses that are, are literally side by side. Answer not a fool according to his folly, <laughs> lest he be wise in his own conceits. I mean, lest, he, lest I'll be like him. Answer fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. So do I answer or do I not answer? Well, look at what it's saying. One reason they're called Proverbs and Dark Sayings is you're supposed to think about it. <laughs> it's not all on the surface. They, they require meditation and putting two and three together and sometimes getting seven because that's the way God did it here. Uh, and it's, it's, there is the danger, I, I really think, of reducing it to the level of what we conceive Sunday school material should be like. Yeah. Sim simple words for simple minds. Well, I don't think it's the children who have the simple minds in this case. I think it's <laughs> we who are guilty of not really wrestling with finding Christ in Proverbs. And I think if we do, there will, and I, I certainly do not claim that I've mastered this by any means. It's still, Proverbs is still in many ways a closed book to me because I haven't taken the time. Maybe when I get older and retire in a few years, I can spend more time there. But I do know that since I've come to understand better what it's about, it is far more meaningful than it was when it was just a list of cute sayings yeah. that Ben Franklin in principle could have said. So we recommend to you all reading, studying Proverbs and not stopping at chapter breaks without a really good reason, like a separate time. And also re <laughs> uh, we recommend, I think we would all recommend doing so with a commentary at hand. Yeah. I, I think Calvin has covered most of the proverbs but um i could be wrong on that i just i know that normally i search a thing and i go like this first calvin commentary and something pops up <laughs> but <laughs> I, don't, um, I don't i don't think calvin did a commentary on proverbs, did he but, not oh okay I'm, well I'm, I'm, unfortunately i'm not in my i could walk into my library and, you know what i'm gonna google it let's you do that <laughs> i was gonna say i could get up and walk in my library uh, that's disturbing it it knew i was gonna ask about <laughs> proverbs google is it's watching listening. us no, it doesn't look like he did because no. all of Proverbs one. No, normally, if if there's like a Calvin's commentary yeah. thing on this page, on this site, it'll be like here's the first, here's the verse, and here's the associated commentary paragraphs or whatever. Yeah. So like all Matthew Henry's commentary is just everything. Yeah. Matthew Henry is a good but, source here, and again, and my recommendation later is going to be Charles Bridges' commentary on Proverbs, yeah. um, where Christ is brought forward, and. I'm sure there are modern commentaries who are beginning to figure this out. And there are probably some older ones. It's just, it is so easy on first reading to just see inspired Ben Franklin. So if we've helped you get away from that, then our work is done here. <laughs> we about our business. Until the next time. Until the next time. Yeah, let's move into recommendations then. Um, well, I'm going to jump right in with <laughs> Charles <Go Bridges. ahead. laughs> Commentary called Oddly I'm enough, shocked. Proverbs. I'm so surprised. <laughs> you took me completely off uh, guard there. It's, it's published by Banner of Truth Trust, who published a lot of the old Puritan works. Uh, originally printed in 1846. The most recent printing that I have, at least, is 1994. So it's it's an older style of English from the mid 1800s. Uh, it's not going to be the language of today's street, but it is careful, scholarly. Lots of footnotes, lots of, a lot of the discussion goes on in the footnotes. You have to be able to follow that. <laughs> uh, but it is absolutely sound. You're, you're not going to have to question, does this guy believe the Bible? Yeah. It will be abundantly clear and it will be of great value to you. Lovely. Emily, do you have one? I do. My recommendation is taking a vacation and not looking at the clock for any reason. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's it. It's self-explanatory. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Yeah. No, I will absolutely second that one though, because it is it is such a wonderful feeling to be like, mm -hmm. I have uh, until I want to go to bed to do whatever. I can <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Where do I need to be? <laughs> Nowhere. <laughs> um, let's see. I, I think I have a couple recommend actually a few recommendations. Uh, this year, last year, I read a lot of books, and mainly it was like audiobooks because that's what I could really focus on at the, uh, during that year. But this year, I haven't listened to as many yet. But I did listen to the audiobook for Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, mm. which is a mm. spy novel by John Le Carre, and I. I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's Irish, but that's his last name. <laughs> and it is it it's a spy thriller and it's very 
British, if if you get my meaning. Yes. Uh, you know, just kind of like old British men going around talking to other old British men <laughs> and vaguely complaining about things like the weather and their old job, which happened to be MI5. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the main plot is like, is there a mole in MI5? And uh, I, I think... I think there's a fair amount of political satire since this is about the British spy <laughs> game written by an Irishman. I think that's just inherent <laughs> in that kind of setup because um, he, every, everyone comes out of it looking a little bit incompetent. Um <laughs> And that just seems to me a very Irish thing to uh, yeah. to highlight. Uh, but I think you, I think you've already implied this, but I think we need to say this is the furthest removed from James Bond that you're going to get. Oh yes, a hundred percent. John John Le Carre, um, he is he is a, I think, fairly prolific spy yeah. novel writer, and a lot of it is critical of of the spy game, as it were. Even though it can be very exciting at times you know there there's there's action moments there's things explode and gunfire happens and and all this but it it, it is very critical of the game as it mm -hmm. is played uh he has a excellent there's a quote that i have seen and i love it so much because there's a side character who meets with the, the spy and it's like in morocco or something and he's this you know not morocco um somewhere in the middle east and he's he's you know very the, the side characters he's very much like um the egyptian character side character in indiana jones oh yes who, he's like oh yes let me bring you to my family and we will all have a great meal together and i will treat you like a king because we are friends now and yeah. but he has this line where he basically goes like you know you you english have the problem of forgetting because today was created by yesterday. Mm. And if you do not know what yesterday was, you will be blind to today and the future. He goes, ask the Indian where he was when the British did, you know, I forget the atrocity because there's so many in India um, <laughs> in this year, or ask the Irishman where he was on uh in, in 1912 and he will tell you the color of his shirt what yeah. shoes he was wearing exactly who who was in his field of vision because it is still in his mind and if you ask the englishman the same thing forget about it is his question forget it it's the past it doesn't matter anymore mm -hmm. uh anyway so john le Carre is actually a very fantastic writer and i think i've gone too long giving recommendations and explaining <laughs> this particular author. So I, I will leave it at that. But um, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy is actually a very uh, compelling book that I, I enjoyed listening to. And I will probably need to listen to it again to really understand everything that happened because it's sort of the nature of spy thrillers and mm. mystery is like, oh, you know, I, I've heard it. I need to listen to it again to really catch everything. So yeah, there we go. All right. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for joining me for this conversation. It was lovely having Emily back, and it was good to hear from, from you your thoughts, Greg. Uh, if you would like to follow us, you can do so on our YouTube. Uh, we also have Rumble. Uh, we have a Facebook page, which is not very active at the moment. And uh, if you want to subscribe to us, we are on pretty much all of the podcast uh, catchers, uh, Spotify and uh, Podcast Addict and all these things. If you find one that we're not on, send us an email and let us know. Our email is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can also send us questions. We would be happy to answer questions on the air. We've done that before. Uh, if you'd like to support us financially, you can do so at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. And we want to thank all of our financial supporters. Uh, you help us afford the software that lets us edit these episodes easily, and we very much appreciate that. Finally, thanks to David Maxson, our producer, and Emily's awfully wedded husband. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>